Welcome to the FRB show. Hosted by Front Row Brian. With Filthy. Tom Lawler. So in this special Wednesday edition of the Filthy FRB show, we'll kick things off talking about Phil Davis signing with Bellator. It's been rumored for quite a while. You know, he's a guy in the UFC, or was in the UFC rather, and he had a pretty good record. I mean, he, you know, he beat Leota Machida. You know, um, he beat Gustafson, and there's no, and he beat Glover Teixeira. So, this is a this is a pretty big story. And what were your initial? What was your initial reaction to it, Tom? Well, we've kind of heard uh, rumblings in this direction for a while, or at least I saw them on the internet. So I wasn't too surprised uh, when I heard that this was going on. You know, Phil's contract had run up, uh, and he decided not to renegotiate before the loss to Ryan Bader, uh, and. Honestly, I think that this decision makes a lot of sense for both parties. Um, a lot of a lot of fans complain to the UFC about Phil's style. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't necessarily enjoy watching him fight, and uh, you know it's only going to bolster the light heavyweight ranks in Bellator. So you know I'm sure the UFC is not going to be too upset if Phil Davis goes over there and beats Liam McGeary and takes the title. So I think it makes a, a lot of sense for both parties, and um, it'll give Phil a little bit more exposure and push as like the top guy or one of the top two or three guys in that division in Bellator. And uh, I think it'll be great for him. So how do you think they book it? What's his debut fight? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there, there's a few ways you could go with this. I mean, uh, with the way Bellator has been booking shows, you could throw him in uh, against somebody right off the bat. Uh, you know, a, a guy like King Mo would probably um, be a win-win situation for both guys because King Mo will talk a lot of trash and Phil Davis seems you know kind of eager to do the same thing in a way uh, I'm not sure how many fans would be clamoring to see that fight because there's a lot of people bitching about King Mo uh, getting takedowns and staying on top too so you know it could be one of those 15 minute striking matches between two guys uh, who were accustomed to see wrestling so either you go that route or you just you know give him a can yeah I mean I guess it comes down to who's who's fighting McGeary next is it going to be Tito? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think they've announced anything. But um, you know, if we look at the Bellator tournament winners, I don't. I don't know that they even have anybody waiting at two hundred five. Yeah, I don't think so either. And I, I don't. I don't know if King Mo versus Phil Davis is stylistically is a. I mean, I, I said it today on Twitter. I, I just don't see how much Phil Davis moves the needle. He's a guy. You look at his resume, and it's it's very respectable. You know, he, he's not an elite guy, but you know, for the past four or five years, he's been consistently amongst the top seven or eight guys in the world in his weight class. So you can't argue against what he's done, but the way he's done it, and I don't think he's built up much of a fan base, which which is uh, surprising to me because. You know, everybody I talk to about him says how funny he is, you know, just in person. And then you get him on camera and it it, it just doesn't it doesn't come through. The charisma is just not there. Yeah, uh, well, you know, he'll get more exposure to that kind of stuff with Bellator, I think, uh, as opposed to staying with the UFC. Obviously, you know, he's ranked number seven right now in the UFC rankings. So there's six guys plus a champion ahead of him who are going to get more opportunities when it comes to the media. Uh, when you look at Bellator, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's the case. I mean, I guess you have King Mo. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, are you trying to cut me off? <laughs> I, I got to get this phone out of the, uh, out of my uh, office here. How the hell do you turn this volume down? I don't know, but I was in the middle of probably the most important, uh, the most important message I've ever given to anyone. All right. I, <laughs> all right can you restart that brilliant thought? I, I got to fix that. What, what are you going to fucking redo it? Is this, is this a SmackDown taping? Uh, no, no. It, it, you know, nothing can happen. No, nothing goes wrong when it's live. <laughs> okay. I, I don't all think, right. I don't think we've ever edited anything. Okay, good. Okay, so anyways, yeah, Phil Davis, uh, he'll just get more opportunities to be in front of the camera with Bellator. You know, they got Tito, King Mo, um, that may, you know, may take up some of that time, but 
you know, you really don't see Liam McGeary too much of the media. You don't see Emmanuel Newton too much of the media. So I think uh, Phil Davis will get some more opportunities with Bellator. And, um, you know, maybe he pulls over some of the uh, amateur wrestling fans that he has that maybe don't necessarily watch Bellator that watch him fight. And I wonder if there's a, another story to this that, you know, Phil Davis is a Zinkin Entertainment client. And Aaron Pico is another Zinkin guy. And there's these persisting rumors about difficulties between Zinc and Entertainment and the UFC. And I wonder if this is going to lead to a pipeline of Zinc and guys going to Bellator, which, you know, Ed Ruth, the three-time national champion from Penn State, signed with Zinc and, and I, I think we, you're going to see him in Bellator probably, well, he'd probably be a middleweight. But I, I, what do you think of these, like these management companies who are steering guys directly to a single promotion? I mean, that's been going on since the, you know, the first fights that that ever happened, Brian. Um, I'm not surprised if there's some sort of, you know, relation. Obviously, there's a working relationship of some sort between Zinkin and and Bellator, uh, and you could take a look back throughout, you know the the ages of MMA and look at the relationship that you know some of those some of those fighters had who I believe are Zinkin guys had with uh, Strike Force in the past you know um, yeah and I, I I should correct something it's not like they're sending everyone there I mean Zinkin like Chuck Liddell Forrest Griffin Josh Koscheck all were, were with the UFC but I'm talking more about the the up and coming guys you know like uh, like Pico you know why why did Bellator, I, I, I mean, Bellator signed him because he's got a lot of potential, but, but why didn't they just like, you know, let it, let him sit a little bit? You know, he's not going to step in, into a cage till 2017. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's the same, it's going to be the same thing with Ed Ruth. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at, I mean, look, Scott Coker's from the Bay Area, right? Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but so is the management team, correct? Yeah. Zinkin's headquarters, right? So, I mean, there's obviously ties there that, you know, you can't discount. So, you know, it could be something as simple as that. They just, they enjoy each other's company and like working together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. I, I just wonder about the future, you know, um, like Rockhold or Daniel Cormier, you know, cause it's easy to say right now when you got four fights left on your deal, oh, I'm happy where I am fighting the best guys in the world. But Viacom, you know, it, I, I can't say they tampered with this, but there's ways of getting messages to guys through back channels. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the the type of money that they're talking is going to be incredibly attractive. I mean, UFC didn't even, I don't even think they considered matching this deal. I, I got to, I don't know how much it is, but I, I would think it's about 100000 or more per fight. Which, I mean, uh, for a guy number seven or number eight in the world who really doesn't have much of a fan base, that's that's a pretty considerable investment. Yeah, not only that, but you also have to take into account the money that you know Phil Davis might be losing in the future uh, from sponsors by simply staying with the UFC. You know, he could lose, I don't know what kind of money he has coming in from um, apparel sponsors or maybe you know other, other companies that are, are going to be forced out of the UFC when the Reebok deal begins, but it could be enough that, you know, it, it made it more attractive to go with Bellator and you could keep a hold of some of those sponsors. Um, you know, it makes some more money off of them that way. You know, that's, that's a really good point, Tom, because I, I thought I had somebody tweet me today and say that he, Phil Davis just signed a deal with Affliction and it, it really didn't make much sense to sign a deal with Affliction when the Reebok uniform is coming in July. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Who knows? Uh, Affliction's still a big company, so I'm sure he's getting uh, a decent chunk of change from him. And it, it could be enough to offset, you know, whatever uh, the extra visibility he would have in the UFC or, um, you know, whatever whatever their marketing machine could come up, uh, come up with for him, you know, simply by holding on to the sponsors that he has or, or getting new ones. Um, that he wouldn't have a chance to if he stuck with the UFC. So I think it's going to be beneficial for him. Uh, I think he'll be at the top of Bellator for a while, and I think they'll give him the immediate push when it comes. 
Yeah, I, I just hope the, the gravy train, you know, doesn't run dry at Bellator, that maybe they don't get the results that they want right away. And, that, you know, they start second guessing, you know, spending big money on, on the Phil Davises of the world. And then maybe when when a real big name actually is available, they don't want to they don't want to take the checkbook out anymore. I mean, there, there's big names that they're signing. I, I mean, we could talk about fighting ability all day, but Ken Shamrock's a pretty big name. Uh, Kimbo Slice is a pretty big name, you know. So, I mean, they're not afraid to throw money at, at these big name guys. It seems like they have a strategy of, you know, loading up the top of the card with, uh, you know, maybe a freak show style fight for their big show that everybody, you know, wants to see. It'll bring in the the casual viewers or the people who are, you know, curious about it. And then putting some real legitimate fighters on the undercard. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that strategy continue on and, you know, to help Bellator grow, really. Yeah, and it's a, it's an exciting time for the guys that are that are free agents because it, it's been a while since they've actually had some leverage. You know, Japan dried up. Um, you know, World Series of Fighting is on death's door. Um, you know, Titan doesn't pay very well. Who, who, I mean, who else is out? Oh, well, you got one FC, but they seem to be very inconsistent with, with the way they'll splurge, you know, like they'll, they'll pay Askren a, a bunch of money and then yeah. they don't, then they have like a bunch of guys you've never heard of. Yeah. Yeah. Or they, I know that they throw uh, a lot of money at Bibiano Fernandez, you right. know, and that's why he stayed uh, fighting over in, uh, in Asia, you know, as opposed to being in the UFC. So um yeah i don't i don't really it's just a different business over there you know there, there's certain things that drive the business over here like pay-per-view that aren't uh ingrained in the culture there and and um it's a very tough area to predict uh i think as far as what's going to catch on and what's not you know could you have imagined that sap time was going to catch on like it did back in the day uh you know even after he started losing fights he was still a huge name so, you know, you never know in comparison to what is looked at as successful here or what's going to be successful there. Sure. And you mentioned Bob Sapp. And, you know, we've been discussing off air about doing some some retrospectives on, on past MMA events. And it would be interesting to go back and look at Bob Sapp's position about, you know, what, 11 or 12 years ago. And yeah. I think people who might be somewhat new to the sport would be shocked. I mean, I don't know the exact rating off off the top of my head, but I think it was something like it was in the forty rating. I mean, as far as I forget what fight it was. I know Meltzer has. Uh, it would be the fight against Aki Bono. Uh, I believe it headlined one of the New Year's Eve cards uh, in Japan back in. Uh, my guess is like two thousand three. I don't know. Let me look this up. Yeah, uh, you, 54, yeah hey, 54 million viewers in 2003. Boom! Eat so, it, Melton. <laughs> so what, what was the rating, though? Was it like 40 or 42? Uh, or? No, let, I'll try to find that. You know, I often, while you're, you're finding it, I'll, I'll tell people 40, about the TV. 43.1 rating on TBS. Uh, not sure what time the show started, but there's no way in hell it started at 6.05. Sure. So, I mean, uh, for the pe- for the people that might not understand these these ratings thing, and I didn't for the longest time, the rating, you know, like a forty rating, that means forty percent of all the televisions in that country tuned in to watch the program. Now, the other thing you'll hear is, oh, it got a forty rating and a fifty five share. The share part means the percentage of televisions that were tuned into that program. At the time, the, the number of televisions that were actually on, mm-hmm. and so yes. you'll you'll see that terminology a lot, you know, with the UFC ratings and, and such. So, okay, just to clarify on this, okay, the Sap Akibono fight, which uh, Sap ended up crushing him with pure beautiful technique and skill, um, that that got a forty two point five rating, and it had fifty four million viewers. Okay, that was two thousand three. Now. That is behind uh, the number one all-time like viewed fight. Okay, when it comes to these ratings, was can you guess? 
You know? Uh, was it something with Enoki and Don Fry? No. Close, though. It was Enoki and Ali. Oh, right. Yeah. The fight that they had, you know, way back when. Which is another thing we talked about is covering some of these random fights throughout history that, you know, people may not know that uh, Antonio Inoki and Muhammad Ali had a, a mixed rules fight uh, way back when. So, you know, that's it's, something we can talk about in the future, uh, catch people up with. And, uh, and what's know. so interesting about that 54 million viewers, I just Googled Japan population 2000, you know, just to, uh, because they probably they don't do a census every year. So it was 127 million in 2000. So 54 million out of, I don't know, let's just call it 130 million a couple of years later. 54 million out of 130 million people in the country watched that fight. That's, that's staggering. Yeah, it's crazy. It really is. Uh, to think and think about how far they've fallen in terms of MMA nowadays. Uh, you know, they just don't even have the market for it at this point. And, you know, 12 years ago, you had uh, half the country watching it on New Year's Eve. So it's a big time, stark contrast. Yeah, it, it, it's terrible. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, Japanese MMA, you know, I the rules and, you know, the no drug testing and, and the worked fights, I, I wasn't really a fan of. But it was just the debate over, you know, who had the better fighters. I mean, that was that was all that was talked about on the message boards eight, nine, ten years ago. I mean, we're we're kind of missing that. It's like, well, we've seen all the big fights. And I don't know, maybe that's why... MMA is just not as popular anymore. Yeah, well, you know, it's, I'm looking at the uh, the top fights throughout uh, history in Japan as far as ratings go, and this entire list is filled with guys who you would not consider to be some of the top fighters, um, you know, of all time in MMA. You know, it's it's littered with freak show fights. Uh, it's littered with big name stars who necessarily weren't the top top fighters. Like you have Bob Sapp and Akibono at one. Uh, you know, Masato and Kid Yamamoto, who are both kind of like uh, heartthrobs in a way, is the number two fight. You get another Bob Sapp fight. And then you have a, a few times there's actors like Bobby Oligan, uh, who's also, you know, he's an actor, comedian. Um, Ken Kaneko is another actor and, uh, and, you know, TV actor and movie actor uh, on there doing MMA fights. So it's always been kind of like a freak show thing there. And, uh, you know, I think Bellator is just borrowing from that a little bit if we can get back to what we were talking about. And, uh, you know, I think they're going to they're gonna add some more people to their ranks uh, from the UFC. And uh, there's a number of guys who I think would do really well there. Or, uh, you know, at least if they, if they left the UFC and went to Bellator, it would serve them better as far as their visibility and, and their ability to be pushed to the top goes. So who, who are your, like, top guys that you think should do their best to try to get to Bellator – from a competition point of view and then ultimately from a financial point of view because this is how these guys put food on the table. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I took a look at the rankings throughout pretty much all the all the weight classes. Now, one of the issues that you run into is like flyweight, you know, 125, 135. Those weight classes have less competitors, um, you know, as compared to like lightweight, welterweight and some of the other weight classes. So – you know, obviously, all the females will probably be better off staying uh, in the UFC because if you're a female fighter and you're a woman's straw weight, you know, you're almost in the top 15 right off the bat. You know, same thing with the, the bantam weights um, and the men's fly weights. So there's not too many people who I would really, um, you know, think would, would serve themselves better in Bellator until we hit, you know, 145. I let it in. I think most of the guys. Um, are doing fine in the UFC. Maybe a guy who's been around a lot longer than some of the other names is a guy like Jeremy Stevens, right? Who, you know, every once in a while gets thrown into a main event, uh, but he's not really in the title picture, even though he's in the, the, the top 15 at featherweight. And uh, he's got a very exciting style. People want to see him fight, you know, and I think that he could, you know, even be higher up on the card in Bellator than he is in the UFC. Um, what do you think about him? Yeah, I think that's a really good example. You know, he's a guy that's, you know, just just kind of he's he's surviving. You know, he's he's making a making some decent money in, in the UFC, but he's really not going to the top. Well, guys are just better than him. 
I, I yeah, and he's got a, a pretty friendly, uh, fan friendly style. You know, he's going to throw some hands, but obviously he can handle himself on the ground too. Yeah, yeah, and another guy, uh, you know, and kind of like a similar similar idea is uh, Josh Thompson. You know, obviously we were talking about the Zinkin uh, connection before, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe he's a Zinkin guy. Uh, and yep. he has he has a pass with Strike Force uh, where he did very well. So. You know, I think a guy like Josh Thompson, um, even somebody, you know, I'd like to see maybe even Jim Miller go over and fight for, for Bellator. I don't think it'll happen because uh, I think he probably has a really good relationship with the UFC based on how long he's been there. But, you know, I think he could uh, he could beat some people, but he also has some really tough fights there. And he's been around long enough in the UFC um, that going there might give him, you know, a little bit of a fresh start. Sure. And you know, Tom. Actually, I, I don't know if I if I forgot to tell you, but we're going to be talking to somebody at Counter Move. That's the fantasy MMA game. Yep, Christy. She's going to come on you now after we're done here, and you know, okay. she'll just tell us a little bit about it, and you know, tell the tell the people that listen how they can take part of the games, and apparently, you can make a bunch of money. You know, I I, I don't know how to play. That's why I'm having her get on the phone and and kind of break it down and and. Uh, Make it like I'm a first grader, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, there's there's some a, a couple other people, um, you know. Really, the top fifteen guys at middleweight. Uh, you know, if you look through it, you don't see too many names that would probably serve themselves better in Bellator. Maybe Gegard Mousasi, which is kind of a similar thing as to uh, when he was in Strike Force. You know, I don't see him getting a title shot anytime soon uh, in the UFC. But you know, people like to watch him fight. Uh, he has a decent, decent name, a decent following. So uh, he's another guy who I think would serve themselves better, even though I'm not sure that'll happen. Yeah, and it might be tough, you know. Uh, at eighty, at eighty five, Halsey man's a powerhouse, you know, wrestler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be- but we were talking, we were talking uh, last show, right? You you brought up Kendall Grove and was complaining about having Kendall Grove fight Brandon Halsey. Well. You know that means that that division is probably wide open for anybody that wants to step in there and go towards the top. So, uh, you know, if I was like a, a guy who's at one eighty five, or hell, even somebody like I don't know, like Shogun, right, dropping down in weight class, I, I don't think he's going to be at the top at one eighty five in in the UFC, but uh, he yeah. sure as hell could make a run at it in Bellator. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a great uh, example of a guy that I hope he's made enough money, and yeah, I. I you know, I think he's 32 years old. It's amazing how long he's been around and how much damage has been afflicted, you know, that he's taken. So, you know, I, I hate to be the, one of those guys that, you know, tell people when, you know, when they're done, you know, cause it, it's, it's not, it's not my life that I have to live, but man, he, he seems like he better wrap it up quick or like you said, go to Bellator and fight lesser competition and that will extend your career. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and I think some of these guys, like uh, there are guys who's who have come over in the UFC, and you can tell um, that they were benefiting from being, you know, in Strike Force where they were the top guy. Like, you know, we talked a little bit about Josh Thompson. He's ranked tenth at one fifty five, but uh, you know, him and Gilbert Melendez pretty much had a stranglehold at uh, the one fifty five title in Strike Force. For a while, and then you know you have other guys. Tarek Safadine, his star was really on the rise at the end of the Strike Force era, and uh, you know he's sitting in that middle of that top fifteen now. So um, there are people who have come over, and, and we've seen that they are you know some of the top guys in the world, but not necessarily the top guy uh, like they were in other promotions. And you always have the opportunity to go somewhere and reinvent yourself, uh, as we've seen with like Rumble Johnson. Um, Maybe even Andre Orlovsky is another example. You know, two guys who have been away from the UFC for a while. Same thing with Robbie Lawler. You know, maybe you go to a new promotion, you get a fresh start, it reinvigorates you. Um, you know, and you get to the top of the top of that uh, promotion. Or, yes. or maybe hell, maybe you just jump on a new cycle and uh, <laughs> go on a runner. <laughs> yeah. Running. Well, I, it, you know, or you can just go to American top team like Robbie Lawler did and then all of a sudden become the world champion after losing four out of five. It, it works real easy. Uh, yeah, I'm not touching that comment. <laughs> I no comment on that because I don't know shit, shit about it. 
<laughs> I'm not jumping in the accusation train here, buddy. <laughs> All right. So at, what about at, uh, if we're moving up uh, 205, other than Phil Davis, who who else in the UFC do you think could really benefit from moving over? Uh, like I said, you know, uh, I think Shogun, um, Feijal is another guy. Really any of the guys that <clears throat> you look at in the in, in about 10 through 15 because I don't think uh, – I don't see Shogun or – uh, Fei Zhao or uh, Little Nog getting a title shot soon. Uh, Patrick Cummins, I think, has has an opportunity to break into that top ten. I think he will be, break into the top ten uh, pretty soon. Uh, but you know, as far as that goes, I think all the other guys uh, just stay up by the top. It'll be interesting to see, or or stay with the UFC. It'll be interesting to see what happens if Anthony Johnson beats uh, John Jones. If you know Rashad Evans even makes a run and comes back. Um, you know, or if he decides to drop weight or, or what the case may be. Because uh, I'm pretty sure that he's not looking to challenge Anthony Johnson for the title if Johnson beats Jones, if that fight even happens. So, uh, you know, Rashad Evans even might be a guy who, you know, could go over there and, uh, like you said, extend his career uh, by fighting a little bit lesser competition and, you know, also be pushed as, a, you know, a big name, which he is. Yeah, so you said like if that fight happens, meaning Johnson and and, and John Jones, why? Because I've I've heard a lot of people say if that fight happens, wh- why do you say that? Oh, I'm saying it for the same reasons that those people are saying. I'm, I'm listening to them. I don't have any inside information. Believe me. I got you. So you don't know why they're saying that. You're just kind of go uh, listening to well, them because they sound like they're informed. No, well, to be honest, I mean, any time that people start talking about canceling fights now, uh, unless you've got like a bone sticking out of your skin, you know, a lot of people are just going to assume that it's due to PED usage, right? You have these people have to cycle on, they have to cycle off with the new testing rules. Things might get screwed up. Who knows? Um, and I think that's the speculation that a lot of people have uh, in regards to this fight, whether it's John Jones or Anthony Johnson. I don't know exactly what people are are imagining these guys are on that's going to hinder the fight but um you know that seems to be the prevailing sentiment is that anybody thinks the fight's not going to happen it's because somebody's going to you know test positive for something yeah and uh yoel romero did himself no favors pulling out of a fight like 10 days you know uh, before this saturday night card i'm just like what, what was the injury they claimed uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't seen too much from that, from the camp unless, uh, you know, except for that they, uh, dropped out of the fight and, you know, <laughs> and, and unless somebody in, or until somebody tests positive, you can't really say that they're, that they're on something, I guess. So, um, you know, who knows if he's injured or not, I guess him and his team do. Uh, but you know, there's been nothing that I've seen. Uh, that would suggest that he's not injured, I guess. So. <laughs> the, I mean, you have to take, the, well, the Brian, you have to take people at face value. I mean, it, you have to take what they say uh, until they're proven wrong, right? You're innocent until proven guilty. Um, so, in the court of public matter, I, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say one way or another because Yo Romero has never been caught on anything, uh, to my knowledge. Now, if he has and he pulled out, then that's a different story. So who do you got at, at heavyweight that should move over to Bellator? Come on. Are you kidding me? No one. If you're the top 15 in heavyweight at the UFC, there's only like three or four guys that aren't in the rankings. So, you know, stick yeah. around. There. There's not much going on in, in Bellator. Nobody even looks at the Bellator heavyweight division and says, you know, oh, these guys are some of the best guys in the world. They do have a lot of, a lot of Europeans. Um, so if you were the Bellator heavyweight champion, you may have a shot at you know, basically getting pushed through the roof as a hometown guy uh, just by being American. So, you know, maybe, um, I don't know, you know, Josh Barnett, that would be a guy uh, who I think would probably fare really well over there. Overeem, you know, uh, that's another guy. People are always going to want to watch him fight just because of how he looks. Uh, And, you know, he's not really sniffing at the UFC title right now, so he could be the top dog in Bellator. Yeah, you're right about Overeem because I think Bellator was the reason why he didn't get released because he makes a lot of money and you know he had lost uh, I, I I don't know maybe three out of four or something like that. Usually when you make a lot of money and you go on a losing streak like that, they'll they'll cut you. But I, I think 
they said, well, he's just going to go to Bellator. It's not like he's going to retire. And yep. and he can draw because he, he's got a great look. Yeah, well, I mean, look, they, uh, UFC has Crow Cop, uh, who was a proven draw, proved himself this past weekend. And, uh, you know, they kept him strong in the main event. And uh, it worked out well for him. You know, you have all these shows. These shows need main eventers. And whether it's, um, you know, two guys who are ranked fourth and fifth or third and fourth and they're vying for the number one spot or for a title shot or uh, whether it's Mirko Krokop, you got to bring the fans in. So, um, you know, you tell me, would you rather watch Krokop versus Gonzaga or are you rather, uh, would you be more excited to watch John Moraga versus Juicier Formiga? The, fir- the first one. Yeah, I, the first one. I haven't sure. heard. I haven't heard of the other guys. They 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 could be your your landscapers for all I know. John Mar- <laughs> John Moraga fought for the title at one twenty five. No, oh. I believe it was on a Fox show. So uh, against Demetrius Johnson. So no, yeah, no. right there. I mean, that proves um, you know that these these fights with name guys, whether it's Kimbo and Shamrock, whether it's Gonzaga versus Crope Cop. Or, uh, you know, I don't know who another uh, – whether it's Lesnar versus Reigns. You know, you got to go with the, the fight center to bring, uh, bring the fans in. So Yeah. You know, Tom, there's been a couple interesting news stories about Anderson Silva just this week. A couple days ago, he wants to petition to represent Brazil in Taekwondo in the 2016 Olympics. And I don't know if this is true, but I heard, like, he can get a bye – right into the games like they don't have trials they just kind of like pick somebody like their taekwondo federation so it, it's possible i mean it's not like impossible it's not like you know kurt angle you know getting through the u.s open and the and the olympic trials well actually since he's a former olympic champion he, he would get a bye to the trials but um and then 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 the, the second story is Anderson Silva is proposing a rematch against Nick Diaz, but this time in Brazil. Yeah, both of them are uh, pretty unbelievable to me. Um, you know, at, and actually, I think the Anderson Silva and Taekwondo um, you know, scenario might have a better chance of happening than Diaz versus Silva in Brazil. Now, why do you say that? Because of the suspension? Uh, yeah, the suspension and... You know, remember those 2016 Olympics are in Rio, uh, so it's going to be a huge deal if if Anderson's able to get through there, and you know if they can just pass him through whatever avenues they need to, uh, that might generate enough you know public interest that it's worth it uh, to kind of take the risk. Now, as far as Silva and Diaz goes, like I mean, Anderson Silva hasn't even been dealt his punishment by the Nevada Athletic Commission, to my knowledge. Um, so who knows who knows what the situation is there, and he's sure as shit not going to fight Nick Diaz under suspension in Brazil. UFC is not going to let that happen, and who knows if Nick Diaz even wants to fight him again? You know, Nick Diaz is probably pretty pissed off that he had to fight an Anderson Silva who gets uh, you know test positive for steroids. So who knows if that's even a fight he's interested in? And do you think the fans would be interested in that fight? Because I thought the first fight sucked. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure the fans would watch it. It, it's going to still be a big story. You know, we have Anderson Silva coming back after a year-long layoff because of a, a injury to his leg. Now you're going to have a year-long layoff coming back amidst all this controversy. Um, I think the fans would love to see that fight again just based on the two guys who are in it. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody would ex- – going in there expect it to be the, uh, the fight of the night or, you know, the fight of the century. But with each guy – uh, against virtually anyone they're going to draw. So put them together, and I think it would still do fine. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess Anderson's going to get his punishment later this month, I believe. And I've I talked to some people, and they, they say nine months, and I, I'm thinking it's going to be a year. I mean, he it sounds like he, you know, he took the substance, then stopped taking it, and then started taking it again. I, you know, he had two drug, uh, two failures, and then plus the, the benzos. You know, I, I just can't see them giving nine months. Yeah, I, I don't understand the whole, uh, the the defense from Anderson Silva's team, or, um, you know, the people who are supporting him. It, it doesn't matter what he was taking it for, if he started and stopped, 
or what the case may be, it's still illegal. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else, Tom, on your mind that, that you want to talk about before we uh, give Christy a call, a counter move? And uh, nah, nothing now. All right. Well, let's uh, we'll get Christy on the line. We'll talk a little bit about counter move fantasy MMA. And Tom, we're joined now by Christy Sullivan. She is from Counter Move, which is a fantasy MMA website. And for full disclosure, I really don't know anything about fantasy MMA or even fantasy sports. I mean, my, I usually just kind of, you know, deposit my money illegally in some offshore account and and you know bet minus one hundred and fifty or under over. Like I'm sure a lot of you degenerates out there do. Uh, what, uh, what do you do, Tom? Well, being that I live in Vegas, I just kind of oh, stroll yeah. over. Or I stroll over to the sports book. Uh, hopefully, on that day, no one has off themselves at the buffet, so I can <laughs> uh, place my bet and collect my winnings. Uh, Christy, that's a true story. I went <laughs> I to the buffet. I read I it. Bu- yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, hopefully that's not going on. I can place some bets and pick up my money. But um, when it comes to doing the stuff on the internet, Brian, I'm kind of with you on this one. And uh, luckily, that's why we have Christy here to explain it to us simpletons. Yeah, so so explain it to Tom and I, and uh, you know, like like we know nothing. You got it. Well, on that very morbid note, which I did read about that story. Um, <laughs> You know, it's it's not that much different in the sense that you want to pick. You're, you're trying to assemble a team of winners. The only difference is is it, it's a it's a real geeky way for avid fans of a sport to really really get their knowledge to pay off. So it's not just a straight outcome. So what that means is you're not just going to choose who's the winner between. Luke Rockhold and say Mashida. You're going to have to choose five fighters and their price in the game based off their relative odds, which oftentimes, more times than not, are cor- closely correlated to Vegas odds. So Tom, you'll be familiar with that, even you, Brian. So you go in a game, you'll see the, the pricing for a fighter, and you're given an art- artificial salary cap of 25 k to draft five fighters. And so why it's called Make a Fantasy Team is you're essentially using this artificial salary cap to assemble a team. And how they're scored in a fight is we use um, UFC's official stat provider fight metric, and it basically just tal- tal- tallies and awards points for every offensive position. So you get points for strikes landed, submission attempts, knockdowns, all that kind of stuff. So, And then on top of it, you get a bonus if they win early. So you essentially want to pick a winner that's of, of your team of five. You want them all to be winners, but you want them to have a solid performance. So to give you an example... Um, you know, Jake Shields is someone who has a very strong record in the UFC overall during his time there, but he wasn't exactly a finisher. There's other people that you would say win a lot, but they're not exactly finishers. So you want a team of five that's not only winning, but they're win- winning in devastating fashion, right? So that's why heavyweights are good and, you know, people that finish early like Ronda Rousey, etc. And sense? you can also add Tom Lawler always finishes early. <laughs> Thanks a lot, buddy. Blast it. That's what I was told. I, I <laughs> Who the hell told you that? Well, that's my question. I, that's I my, want to know. I have sources. That's that's why I, I, I'm me. Okay. <laughs> well, this this is um, – yeah, that's not always a bad thing, but this is a situation where it's always a good thing to finish early. <laughs> <laughs> so you were going to ask a question, Tom. What what do you got for Christy? I don't know. I'm kind of disgusted by where you took the, this. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. You, you, okay. can, you can handle basically, that. Basically, what I was going to say was uh, I was going to tell her not to give out the betting strategy uh, on the air and to let me know, you know, off the record so that I'm not losing every time in counter move. Because it's pretty sad if, you know, you're a UFC fighter, you're supposed to be a professional, and you can't even pick who's going to win the fights compared to, you know, some guy sitting at his computer drinking 30 cores light during the taping of a podcast who can't get his phone out of the room. I can help you out. I can give you some tips. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> so, Chrissy, tell us a little bit. What's the history of Countermove? Like, is it your company? 
Yeah, so um, our two founders, our original, you know, our two co-founders are Brian and Aaron, and both of them are jiu-jitsu black belts. Um, I have been with the company almost since the very beginning, and I'm a brown belt in jiu-jitsu, so we're all martial artists. And the two of them met up and started it together. I came in less, like, less than a year after. And, um, yeah, we're just hard, you know, we're just in this sport. We love this sport of MMA and martial arts. And, um, you know, that this didn't exist really in MMA at all. And it's been taking off in, you know, basketball and football for a long time. So um, Aaron's really the brains behind the, the algorithm for it and how the fighters are priced, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of the front and back end and, and of the company. And I just think that overall, it's a really fun way for people to to really participate in sports, you know, if they, if they really understand fighters and, and they want to cheer along and they have like their, it just adds another level. And, um, you know, we've been going for a few years now and I think that, yeah, it just makes the overall experience. If you're already watching the fights, you might as well, you know, if you're betting or wagering on fancy sports, it's, it's a fun way to participate and, and earn money from it too at the same time, if you're good. Yeah, I, okay. I, I can see, you know, because, Tom, there's some, there's times I'm watching fights and, you know, I don't know who either guy is. You know, I, I don't know any of the gym he trains. I don't have any connection to them at all. And I don't care who wins, really. It, it doesn't affect my life in the least at all. But if you have some, you know, some fantasy and if you have part of your salary cap allocated towards this guy, you know, you could be on the on the edge of your seat for every fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, just for an example, like this past uh, this past weekend and the weekend before, I placed some not big bets, but you know, bets on uh, basketball and baseball games. And you know, normally I don't give a I don't give a crap about who wins those games, you know. But you know, even having twenty bucks on a game kind of draws you in and uh, gets your interest and makes you pay attention. So uh, for me, you know, it just makes the stuff more fun. Yeah, I I kind of I honestly agree with that for the simple fact that UFC's events alone have just skyrocketed, right, skyrocketed, right? And I think what some of the old school fans of the sport are saying is like I can't I can't catch up with all these this new talent. Like there's so many events now. So like we're already all MMA fans. We're probably going to be watching even the smaller events. Um, if not, like people are still, you know, wanting to stay engaged and, and it's a fun way to actually like learn about them. So this undercard, this undercard fighter that no one's ever heard of, like it, it, it makes it fun because there's a game around it. And then at least like when that guy fights again, you're like, Oh, I remember him. He was on my fantasy team. He knocked out that guy. Like it just makes, you know, it a, a more fun way to stay engaged in the sport and then have it pay off. Um, overall. Are you on yeah. a motorcycle or is it Tommy? I'm motorcycle? Not. I am here. I think I hear. Yeah, there's actually a GT Mustang that's parking uh, near. <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. it. It's better than than my phone ringing. But uh, Tom, what what were you uh, gonna say there? Oh yeah. So uh, Christy, if you're so say um, you're an outsider, you're a somebody who wants to go ahead and play against myself and Brian. How do you do that? Um. Well. It just depends. <laughs> you guys are going to have a free roll game. So um, I would say the best way for people to try it if they haven't done it before is um, hit up your free roll link. That's the best way. Free roll is basically a you know gambling term, but it means a free entry game that has a cash prize pool. So um, that would probably be the best way. And then if you you know want to get all the way in it, you can go on the website and there's like prize pools anywhere from 10 to 25 grand. So if you want to try a free roll, that's like – free to enter it's super easy to play and there's no you know we put up the cash prize pool or if they if you're feeling uh risky you just go in and go go all the way in and try for the the prize pools that have like a lot more at stake all right all right right brian you know what's going on now are you caught up 100 percent or what yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm so i i was on, i was on there and i saw like like there's games that you can enter for like a quarter right and there's then there's there's games that you can enter that might be like 50 or 100 dollars. exactly yeah so the the quarter ones are just you know smaller prize pool but super cheap to play in um all the games by the way you can enter in multiple teams so if you just want to try a bunch of different like scenarios like you want Rockhold on one of your teams and you want Mashita or you want Mayweather Pacquiao whatever sport you're playing on our site um and 
yeah, then we have like kind of big baller high roller ones which are like hundred dollar entries and they have like four grand prize pools or twenty five dollar entry and they have ten or twenty five thousand dollar prize pool but there's a big bell curve on those so like the top place like if you have the best teams like will pay out huge in the thousands but you'll still like even if you have a couple people that on your team that lose you can still win cash because the there's hundreds of places in those games you know that pay out so um yeah this is kind of a like for every palette i guess you know <laughs> whatever you fancy sure so like what percentage of like of players like get a part of the prize pool like is it a certain percentage of each pool or hot how do you determine it yeah it depends on the game actually um it really depends on the game. So we have ones where, like, we structure them where um, there's less people who participate and then more people that pay out, right? So um, you can, like, double up your money, et cetera. So it just really depends on the, the, the amount of entries it's set at. So you, so you can look for that. Um, some of them have hundreds, whereas, like, some of them, like the high roller ones, are a lot smaller, but they're bigger to play. Um, they're a larger entry. So it just really depends. So you think you got it, Tom? Yeah, I'm actually uh – I'm looking at it right now, and I'm picking out a team to beat Natasha Wicks uh, <laughs> this weekend. So, uh, yeah, actually, it's pretty easy once you get it figured out. Uh, you know, like Christy was saying, I went on the website. Uh, it shows the salary cap you have for each game, and it's it's really easy. You just click on the uh, the plus sign to add somebody to your team, and you can go from there. It's really user friendly. Um, you know, and that's counter move with a K for anybody that doesn't know how to spell correctly. <laughs> it's K-O-U-N-T-E-R move.com. Uh, yeah, Brian, it's really easy. It's awesome. All right, I'm, I'm going to get on there. And what, are, what what's the plan, Christy? When are we going to – like what's the first event Tom and I are going to be telling people to sign up and play? Well, that's up to you. I mean uh, we can – I'm thinking Mayweather Pacquiao if you want. We have games around that. Um, it's really up to you. We can – you know, the Canada carb for 186 is getting a little softer, um, but that one is I'm down for it too. Um, or 187, you know, so just let me know. I know you guys like wrestling too, so I think May- Mayweather Pacquiao is could be fun. What do you guys think? Well, you well, do well, wrestling too? Uh, uh, yeah, we do. We ha- did a huge one. But ha- since I'm, I don't want to upset anyone about saying things about it's, you know, scripted or whatever but (laughs) so we just do we we do um free roll games only so we we don't do it so people can actually um put play put up an entry fee like no no money wagered we just put free rolls up so it's more for fun um and we just offer it it's kind of fun and we tap we tally it for like chair you know just how many times you get hit by a chair and it's really fun (laughs) it's really funny um but yeah we do have them so I can cool. show you those too sometime. Nice. So, all right. So, I'll uh, I'll talk to, with Tom, and we'll uh, we'll get with my uh, my guy Adam Adam uh, yeah. Martin from Poster Boy Entertainment. He was the one who kind of well, not kind of. He, he he connected us um, with Counter Move. So, uh, thanks, Adam, for finally doing something right. And I knew there was a reason I I kept you around after I fired you from the podcast, but I. <laughs> I, that's actually a true story, <laughs> and, the, and that I, I I needed to that I found Tom. That that's how that came about. No way! Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. But oh, uh, man. yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, that that sounds interesting, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. And uh, so thanks for explaining that to us. And I'll, Tom, no I'll, yeah, Tom, you can have the uh, the last word or anything you want to say. No, uh, thanks to Christy, thanks to Michelle, and uh, thanks to me for coming on the show. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Christy. Appreciate it. The only question that remains is will the number 13 be lucky or unlucky for Stone Cold Steve Austin tonight, the submission match? You can damn well bet it's going to be an unlucky number for Bret Hart. But let me just say this. A submission match is not my kind of match. Do I know a whole lot of wrestling holds? Hell no, I don't. But I'll beat the hell out of you till you do say I quit. You sit there every time you get on TV and say you've been screwed. Let me just tell you this, son. 
I ain't bringing a condom to the ring. I'm bringing a hell of a can of whoop ass. But we're joined, of course, uh, as always, by Filthy Tom Lawler. And then today, Invicta Fly- Flyweight Michelle Old. What's going on, Michelle? Not much, just sitting in traffic. I totally forgot about tax day two. I got that shit done months ago. <laughs> what about you? I mean, I gotta assume for fighters, you know, being independent contractors, it's kind of it's a lot different than someone who's W two'd. Yeah, it is. You know, you get it's a lot of different stuff, but I do my own anyways because I'm smart like that. So it all worked out. How do you handle yours, Tom? Do you have somebody? What? Do- how, how, uh, Tom, uh, how do you handle uh, your taxes? Do you do them yourself or do you have somebody help you with it? Oh, no, I do it myself. No, no, I was asking Tom. I, I... <laughs> What's that? Uh, yeah, I I, uh, I haven't done them yet. So. <laughs> okay, well, okay, so, so af- after this you're going to have to get to work, although you can file a, an extension and I don't think there's any penalties for an extension. Uh, now I'm just gonna hit up TurboTax. Like tonight. <laughs> yep. As soon as this phone calls over. <laughs> That's what's up. So Michelle, you have quite a story. You know, you know, maybe you're not the most well-known fighter, but you seem to have uh, one of the more interesting backgrounds that I've heard about. So tell us, <laughs> how did how did you get into fighting, and like, what led you to get in, get into this, or, or even your childhood? Um, well, I don't know. I've always just kind of been, like, one of those girls that anything a boy could do, I could do, too. I've just always been kind of competitive, and I always wanted to do sports. Um, the family situation wasn't really something that allowed me to do it. So I could do, I did what I could, you know, at school or whatever, like, anything and everything, but I was always very physical, like, fighting with my boyfriends growing up, just, like, anything, like, arm wrestling, anything that was, like, some sort of competitive thing. I just loved it, and I just thought fighting was hilarious. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what my deal was, but I just liked that. And uh, I wish I would have gotten into wrestling that my kid or that my parents would have, you know, because things might have gotten a little gone a little different for me. I think I would have thrived. But uh, then, as I got older, um, yeah, I mean, I did a little bit of uh, amateur boxing and stuff, uh, like fifteen, sixteen, and then uh, just got married real young. Um, to an, like a junior Olympian boxer. I've always just been into athletes and whatnot. And then, uh, you know, had my kids. And after that, I was just wanting to do something kind of to get me out of trouble because I was fighting a lot, you know, just like street fights and just like just stupid shit, you know. And, uh, you know, I was like, I need to get this, get it together. So just started training with one of my friends, you know, boyfriends. And he was uh, like, you know, he took me under his wing, and I didn't even realize, like, how fortunate I was to get somebody, you know, that was training jiu-jitsu, like, boxing, everything. Never charged me a freaking dime. I had no clue, you know? Well, and uh, then, uh, I, you might have been paying him in uh, another way. Oh, fuck no. <laughs> yeah, it, it, surprisingly enough, I'm not really, uh, you know, there's certain things, like, that I met through a friend, like, that was my best friend, and he oh. never was ever inappropriate, like... I can be crazy with some things, but there's other things that, uh, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, I thought you, I thought you said it was your boyfriend. That That's what, no, oh. my, my friend's boyfriend. Oh, I, I totally, yeah. totally misunderstood. So I got pretty lucky on that one. And then I started, uh, wanting to just do a little bit more like wrestling and stuff like that. Just the full thing. So I started over at, uh, combat fitness in Boise. Cause that's where I used to live. And, uh, uh, Scott Jorgensen's gym. And, uh, you know, just went from there and, you know what I mean? It, it, even if I took time off or whatever from the actual fighting, I was always training, and it just was a really good release for me, and it kept me out of trouble, you know? It yeah. Really, it really did. It changed my life, so yeah, it saved so, my life. <laughs> so you mentioned staying out of trouble. Like, what type of trouble were you getting into? I was just always, like, I don't know. I was just always, whenever we would go out, you know, friends or whatever, um, if anybody ever challenged me or anything like that, like, I just loved to fight. I would just get in street fights all day long. If people or my friends were in fights, I'm jumping in. I never knew how to walk away. So that's the kind of, you know, just little minor things like, you know, just like the one time I knocked a guy out, he deserved it. But the cops only saw me knock him out and they arrested me. It was absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, stuff like that just kind of got old. I'm just like, okay, 
you know, and then MMA was kind of starting to be a little bit more popular. And I'm like, this is what I need. And it's like, ever since then, like, I didn't have any issues. You know, they're like, you, you come in here, you fight for money. And I'm like the person that's always walking away now. You know, I do have still a little bit of a temper thing, but I don't really go out much or drink or anything because I know that. And uh, so, you know, it just kind of just changed, you know, your mindset and stuff. So and it really helped out a lot. Yeah, you know, Tom. I mean, even if a if a woman is a is a pro fighter, that's got to be tough on the confidence to get knocked out by one, wouldn't you think? I wasn't even uh, training at that time. I trained after that, but just this guy was—they were all like these the surrounding me and a girl. There's like seven of them, and they just were like, "We're going home. You know, we're gonna go catch cab, get some food. We're good." And they're like, "Well, you're ugly bitches, anyways." And they kept following us, kept following us, and all of a sudden, I felt some guy grab my ass, and I just turned around. And threw a right hand, and he was in a planter in like a big old, you know, cement planter pot pot thing. And I didn't know he was knocked out, and I just kept hitting because I just was freaked out. And then they were like, "Yeah, we had to get the smelling salts. He was knocked out cold." Yada yada. And I'm like, "So you guys saw that?" Well, we the cops were like, "We could hear you hitting him from across the street." And I'm like, "Do you not think that there was a reason? Did you not see there was two girls and like a ton of guys?" And you know what I mean? It was just kind of messed up. And so after that, I'm like, "I gotta do something different." So this um, this guy got knocked out just because he grabbed your ass? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I just turned around and hit him, and, like, it was, yeah. And then they ended up, you know, I had to do, like, a bond forfeiture or something like that. They took it off my record or whatever, but uh, he was, like, willing to fly back in because he was from out of town just to testify against me. And I'm like, you the fuck, what a punk bitch, dude. Like, who does that? Like, isn't it embarrassing enough? Like, who would want to go and actually testify? I'd be like, you know, just pretend that it didn't happen if I was that guy, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, that would that would make sense to me to do that. Yeah, that was gnarly. <laughs> so, have you actually served time in jail? Um. Well, just, just they bonded me out that night. So, no. When I was younger, I was always like on probation and stuff like that for fighting, and you know what I mean. I, I guess I always got lucky because uh, you know my mom always kind of saved me, like running away and stuff. A couple times they put me like in like these uh. Uh, you know, juvie type situations. Yeah. And I'm like, um, I'm running away because my parents are crackheads. So uh, why don't you lock those motherfuckers up? Like, why am I here right now? You know? So both weird. both of your parents were crackheads? They were. My mom is clean and sober now. She got rid of that guy. Um, she has, I would say, like 15 years sobriety and then met her current husband, who I consider my father. Um, and AA and whatnot, and, uh, you know, he's got, like, 25 years sobriety or whatever, so, well, yeah, you know, uh, we were, like, homeless when I was, like, a freshman or anything else, living in a women's shelter and all that, it, it, you know, it was rough, but it was good seeing her get her shit together, that's for sure. So you mentioned that you don't drink anymore, or, or you drink very little? Very little. Um, like, I've been kind of having a rough couple of weeks. So, you know, I, but I just can't, I can't recover any from it anymore. You know what I mean? Like, well, you're I'll not, have, like, you're not that old. Here and there, but I just can't recover from alcohol and it's just not fun all the time unless it's in like a controlled setting. Like I'm not a club late goer. Like I'm a little, a lot different than what people might uh, think. <laughs> yeah, that's so I it. Because I got it out of my system at a very early age. <laughs> Yeah, so you think if if because you, you had your you had your kids kind of young, right? It, yeah. And if if you didn't, you probably would have gotten into wrestling, or you would have liked to have gotten. I mean, were there collegiate programs? I mean, at that point. Um, you know, and it wasn't even something that was on my radar. To be honest, I'm sure that it was. And and I remember in high school, like all my guy friends were always saying, "Michelle, you need to wrestle. You need to wrestle." And my parents just, you know, like, you know, before my mom got sober stuff, it just wasn't important. But, you know, they never cared. They never did anything. And it kind of sucked because my son now, like, he is whooping ass. And I can train with him. Like, he's, like, now my same, like, weight class. And he's like, Mom, you, you'd be so good. Because, like, I'll still hold my own with him, but he's getting better and better and stronger. He's like, I wish you would have wrestled. That would have been so cool. You're just so, like, you're, you're natural at this stuff. And I'm like... Yeah, but then if that would have happened, I wouldn't have had you. So everything happens for a reason. And now look at you. You're you're living it up and you're doing everything I never got to do. So it's all good, man. I have no no regrets on that front, you know. 
Sure. You know, I, I follow you on Instagram and I always see you putting up pictures of, you know, whatever wrestling tournament that you're at. How old yeah, I'll are... overdo it. I overdo it with the kids yeah. there. <laughs> how, how old are your kids? Alex is 14 and a half and uh, Darian's going to be 11 here in the summer. So what do you, what do you think? It, what's Alex's uh, potential as a wrestler? Is he? You think he can win a state championship, or is oh, it yeah. just too That's early? We are. Uh, he went to state. He podiumed, even though this was his first year actually on a team, and he podiumed for folk style. He got eighth place, but he still podiumed and went up a weight class. So that was awesome. He had a sixty-four kid bracket for, and he was doing varsity, even though he was actually a first year too. So you have kids that have been doing it since they're five years old, and he's going up against them. You know, like it was, it was awesome. So then he did his first uh, freestyle Greco tournament this last weekend, and he was against all high schoolers, and he's in eighth grade, and he had only trained it for an actual week, you know, because folk style just finished, and uh, he took gold in uh, Greco and freestyle, and it was a pretty big bracket too. And he went up a weight class to one twenty seven. He walks around about one twenty three. Wow. So, uh, yeah. like, the, his coaches, people, well, they're just obsessed with him. Like, his work ethic, like, that kid just makes me so proud. Like, yeah. <laughs> and he's a way better kid than I was, tell you that. <laughs> he's, he's not getting in fights at school. He's not causing no. problems or anything. Oh, hell no. Very respectful, good grades, good with kids. Like, I had good grades and smart, but I was a little, I didn't have a lot of respect for authority. Mm. So, and that kid, though, he's just... My, I don't even know. I don't know how I got so lucky, but it's pretty awesome to watch. Yeah, authority is often overrated. I, I always tried to try my <laughs> best. I never really got in much trouble, but I, I'd always, you know, try to rally against it uh, when I could. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, that night when I got arrested by uh, for that knocking that guy out, um, and I wasn't saying anything. I was just sitting in the waiting room waiting to get bonded out or whatever. Everybody knew, like, what happened. And then uh, this cop's like, hey, do you think you're something else? So you can just think you're a badass. And I hadn't said anything at all. And I was like, fuck yeah, doggy. <laughs> you don't no. be a dick to me. Like, I didn't even say anything. And he, like, jumped over the counter and whooped my ass, man. He, like, put my hands on my back, smashed me in this in that wall. I had a black eye and all this stuff. And they hogtied me, took my shoes, threw me in the drum tank. And I was like... For a comment, first off, that you initiated, like, I probably could have sued, but I was just, like, so, like, freaked out, you know what I mean? So now when cops are around, I'm just like, sir, yes, fucking sir. And where, this was in Boise? Yeah, there was, there was some shadiness that went on sure. in the police department in Boise back in the day, so. So, uh, your your Twitter account, it's it's pretty colorful, so you, you never really know <laughs> what what's going to be on it, or, or the Instagram, you know, by the same token. Do you let your kids read your Twitter, or, or do you block them from from it? Mm, my my youngest son's not on there, but my oldest son, I don't really censor him, to be honest. And uh, and, he, and look, he's a very good child. I do not ever want to censor my children because you know, and he doesn't really read. He's not on social media that much. He's too busy. Like my oldest son, if he's not training wrestling, doing homework, he's watching wrestling videos. It's his whole entire life right now. So he. You know, I, and, and I do not believe in censorship because I would rather them learn things from me and not their dumbass friends. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's worked out well. That kid has, like, all his teachers love him. Every time, every teacher always says he's a joy to have in class. He's so respectful. He's this, he's that. He has a brilliant sense of humor. He gets it, you know? Um, so, uh, and they're going to find out eventually anyways. It's not like I can sit there and hide who I am. I am who I am, and I'm like that consistently. We don't cuss a lot in the house or anything like that, but, um, you but know. You make up for it on Twitter, though. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck so, yeah. So are the people at school surprised that, that you're his mom? Because you're kind, of, you're kind of young to, to have, like, a, a high school kid. Yeah, and I just get better and better looking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we had, like, a bring a parent to school the other day, and some of those friends were, like, hitting on me because they thought I was his sister. And I was just like, hey, uh, what, what are you doing? And he was like, I'll oh, get off, you know. Well, he's, yeah, he's going to get, he's gonna get tortured. He's going to get tortured I by know. his friends. Like I had a, we had a, a guy like that at our high school and, you know, his mom was hot and, 
I mean, he he just got absolutely tortured. I mean, it wasn't like in a malicious way, but you could tell he was just like <laughs> it would get him so upset. Yep. I mean, it was just like, hey man, it's just one of those things you're just gonna have to come to grips with. Yeah, one well, thing I'm a fighter too, so they're super, you know, they're respectful and stuff. But they didn't know that that was me when I first came in and whatever. But I remember before my mom got sober, well, around the time she was getting sober and healthier and everything else. She was a good-looking lady, and I just remember all my guy friends always wanting to come over to hang out because your mom's so hot. I was like, shut the fuck up. So <laughs> I, I know already what this kid's going through. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, so the other thing that I, I'm, I'm always hearing a lot with you is your problem with Misha Tate and, and Brian Carraway. You know, it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty well documented, you know, all the all the. Well, issues you had. How, how many people though? Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm on a list. They gotta take a number. Like, there's a lot of people that have problems with school. So. There's, there's that many, huh? So I, I guess it's pretty well documented, like all the, the verbal spats right. you've had. But, but what started it? Were, were you friends at first, and then it turned, took a bad turn, or? Well, I used to date Tanya Ebinger, and that's how it all came about. I didn't know Nisha from nobody. You know, she always been cool to me. I had no problem with her whatsoever. But Tanya hated her for whatever reason. I'm just like, you know, keep me out of it. I don't really give a shit. She's never done nothing to me, whatever. But Tanya, I think she's just kind of a hater at the time because, you know, she, she, she's, a, she's a legitimate athlete, just regardless of, you know, things that have gone on between us. Um, you know, and she went through, a, like, a two-year period where people didn't want to work with her, you know. She wasn't getting on cards, and she's just being Misha blow up. I think it was a little bit, like, she's a little bitter about it because, she was trying to fight her for so long, and Nisha kept kind of dodging her and stuff. But Tanya would just put her on blast and disrespect her and go on these, like, female forums and go under my name because they booted Tanya out. <laughs> and she say, she would say, this is Tanya, you know, and Nisha even came to me, like, you know, I think on Facebook, who fucking other could have been, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, MySpace, this is how long ago it was. And she's like, I don't understand why Tanya hates me, anything else, and I go... You know, I explained it to her, and I was like, this is why, and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, when it comes down to it, she's my, you know, main training partner, and, you know, at the time we were dating, so that's who I'm going to back up, you know. But to be honest with you, I go, I really don't give a shit. I really don't give a shit. So but, uh, so you dated Tanya Evinger? Yeah, that's not something I'm fucking proud of. But it <laughs> is, uh, it wasn't so, even something I really chose to do. It just kind of happened, and then she's just, she's one of those people that it's like, you don't leave her because she will make your life hell. She tried to like ruin my life. It was really but, classic crazy. But you're you're you wouldn't you're not a lesbian though. Is it is that No, I'm bi, I would say. I just like who I like, you know. So it just and it depends on cool personality and everything else and then yeah, at first it was just roommates and stuff like that because when Jorgensen and I uh split up so I used to date Scotty, um but you know he was just really insecure and, and kind of said, you can't train in my gym anymore type of thing. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? So I moved to SAC, you know, because it was a very similar setup because, you know, him and Uri and all them were friends and cool and they cross-trained. So it was a good transition for me. And I was just like, well, if I can't train here, there's no other good gym. I'm moving out to Cali, man. going to fucking chase my dreams. And then uh, we were roommates or whatever at first. And then she, it just kind of like happened. And then it was just, I, I figured it out real quick. I'm like, dude, you're just so much drama. It was just so much drama all the time, whether it was me or whoever, and I just couldn't deal with it. And I finally just had to, like, you know, get rid of her or whatever. And I wish we could have stayed friends, you know? But uh, she's just not that kind of person. Yeah. You know, but I, I, she's doing good now, and I'm happy for her. I want nothing but the best for her. But, uh, yeah, that's just, you know, I'm sure she's grown and changed a lot. But uh, this wasn't good a is healthy it, like thing for me to be around, you know. Is isn't there a picture of her doing something to Ronda Rousey? Or is that somebody? No, else? Gina Carano. Gina Carano. That's the that's yeah. the one. Yeah. So I mean, it seems like th there's got to be a lot more athletes in women's MMA that play both sides of the field versus men's. I, I would I would peg in. Well, in versus men's, the men, of course, versus the men. In men's fight, I, I, it's got to be maybe like 2 or 3%, I think. Now, on the the women's, I mean, shit, it's 
yeah, what is it? What, what, what if you had to assign well, a, a figure? It's more accepted by society, A. Then you have, like, there's some, you know, girly girl fighters, and then you come across a lot of um, kind of the more tomboyish type, you know, fighters or whatever, and you kind of just build a bond when you're training, A. Not to mention there's just a lot of full-blown lesbians. And, you know, for me, like, I don't ever want to date anybody that I can whoop their ass. You know what I mean? I always want to date the alpha type. And, and Tanya, you know, when we first started training together, she whooped my ass. So I think some girls are just, like, kind of attracted to that or they get sick of guys or whatever. Or they just try it out just because it's fun. You know what I mean? It's a little rebellious. And it's just, I don't know. I like girly girls and I like, you know, strong females. But So so you tried it, you tried it out and... It, and you liked it, or, or was it just... Uh... Yeah, I, I've had girlfriends since I was, like, 14, so... And if it ever were, you know, it's not something I've ever closed up to. I'm steady checking chicks out all the time. It is what it is. I can't help it. <laughs> you can't help it. Well, uh, that's that's interesting. But, you know, another interesting topic. Uh, how about, like, creepy fans on Facebook or, or, or Twitter? Like, what's your best creepy fan story? What's my best what? Creepy fan story. You like, you know, somebody sending you a message like, I'll send you X, oh. and, you know. I mean, some of them get kind of like, ear, like uh, offended if you don't respond to them and stuff like that. I'm just like, the first off, I'm not obligated. But like, if they're respectful, I will. But they're always just trying to be like, oh, but all they focus on, oh, you're a sexy and you're a fighter. Oh, my God. And they're like, yeah, thanks, whatever. But then, you know, sometimes they'll get all and you're not responding and we'll fuck you and there whatever and I just kind of laugh it off I ignore a lot of it um I get weird shit all the time dick pics all that other stuff it's just unreal it's nothing on like police Herrick level of creepiness you know because just because she's just more well known and on TV and all that but are, it's still are you friends know, with her oh yeah yeah I'm, she I'm, she doesn't she doesn't like me at all really yeah oh I think I've seen that <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think it's more. I think it's more the manager of hers. Oh really? Yeah, but you know, know, it's. uh... I mean, she's really a pretty cool chick. She's not as bad as like people. You know, she can be seem goofy and seem like everything's sexualized and everything else. She's a good girl. She's very serious about her training, and and she's got a stand up personality. She's pretty straightforward. She's you know her pose and stuff looks silly, maybe a little immature sometimes. But she's just fun, and she does what the fuck she wants to do, and I can't have anything but respect for that, and I always have her back, and I totally pull in for her this weekend for sure, and uh, I really do believe in her. I think she's... Over page, you're picking her over page, fans, huh? All right, I guess we had some technical difficulties. We'll probably just uh, cut it right there. <laughs> <laughs> 